So welcome everybody uh, to the panel on uh, attracting talent to the sector. Uh, we have some very interesting uh, um, speakers lined up. Uh, and uh, if I have to go through the WhatsApp conversation, it's, it promises to be a very interesting session. Uh, we, this morning, uh, so I was, as I was saying, that we kicked off uh, yesterday with a, uh, almost close to one and a half two hours conversation on open spaces for, uh, for innovation. And we talked about what are large open spaces that have opened up uh, post COVID where, uh, which were earlier uh, considered a strict no-no as uh, Ravi was talking about his experience with the, with the, the professors. Uh, we had very similar conversations on how people would not think about healthcare, uh, or innovations or different types of ways of accessing uh, uh, workplaces, different types of ways of accessing schools and learning. And uh, quickly that is changing. There is more openness. And what more openness also brings is for an opportunity for us to rethink about how we are serving or what type of programs we are running um, and what more can we do and or what different can we do. Um, this morning, we started with sessions on if that is the uh, reality that we can rethink uh, and that everybody has a chance to completely pivot or completely innovate the way they are working, uh, what is needed to enable that? And so today, we are focusing all our energy on different types of enablers. Uh, so the first enabler that we talked about was how do we build and grow an in uh, ecosystem for innovation? which requires uh, people like media. So we had Anuradha from the Better India talk about the role that they play in bringing a lot of ideas uh, out in open for people to discover, uh, to replicate, for people to, uh, she, I think she used the word Petri dish, that Better India is like a Petri dish of ideas that people can pick up ideas and then build their own on top of that. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, under perspective from three different people uh, we had Santosh uh, Ghosh from Social Finance. Uh, we had um, uh, Shantanu Ghosh from Social mm -hmm. Finance. We had Santosh uh, Ramadas from uh, Skoll. And we had Murgan Vasudevan from Cisco. And the three of them talked about their perspective of building and investing in the early stage organizations or building or investing in a very outcome focused funding. Uh, we also had Manoj Kumar from Social Alpha who talked about the need to build infrastructure, need to build uh, ways to attract talent to think about social problems, and then to have, uh, um, have, have enough infrastructure in place or enough ca patient capital in place for them to, to take actions and build uh, fast. Um, the next session then moved on to uh, the second enabler, which is open ecosystems. And how do we learn from others? How do we build on top of the work that has been done by others? Uh, we looked at, uh, so uh, Sanjay Purohit from Societal Platform led that session and um, uh, had uh, three or four, three uh, different case studies that we went through, uh, which were around uh, open data, open content, open products, or open platform. Uh, and uh, we had some very interesting conversations about how people can leverage open ecosystems and how people should think to scale. Um, and that brings me to the third enabler that we wanted to cover today, is that all of this requires some very interesting mix of talent. Uh, we need new type of energy. We need uh, people to think of social sector as a primary career choice. And uh, with social consciousness at an extreme high right now, how do we uh, sort of define pathways for people to explore social sector? In what are the different types of uh, opportunities that are available? How you as leaders see, um, is the social sector ready to attract people like this as well? Yeah. Uh, so with that, I will uh, just introduce our moderator Satyam and then he can talk about everybody else. Um, we will be accepting questions on the Q&A box. So for all the attendees, uh, uh, please uh, leave your questions uh, as much, as many questions as you leave, as much fun this uh, conversation will be. Um, it will be very, very helpful if you leave uh, 
con uh, questions for each panelist. If you want a certain panelist to uh, answer that question, just write the name of the panelist before your question. Um, so it gives me immense pleasure to invite the panel. Uh, I will uh, first invite the moderator, Satyam. Uh, Satyam runs Arpan Careers, uh, has been spending a lot of time and energy in pulling all of us together uh, in defining what uh, the human resource part of uh, social sector should look like. Uh, he works with very large organizations as well as young uh, entrepreneurs to define what their HR policy should be like, recruit, helps them with recruitment. So looking forward to this conversation, Satyam, and off you go. Thank you so much, Priya. That sounds like a very, very exciting day. I mean, I, I only attended uh, one session in the morning and I could see the energy that people are showing up at nine o'clock in the morning. And now we are at three o'clock yes. uh, and definitely we still have people. So uh, sort of proud of the Nudge team for putting this together. Uh, now, uh, I mean, as today morning, I was thinking about 2020 a lot. And that reminded me of a uh, subprime mortgage crisis when I started my career in the social sector. And as a very, very young boy, I ended up in an organization called Pratham, entered a basement office and reached the room of, uh, reached the room of like one of my supervisors, going to be supervisor. And there I saw Vivek Sharma. So Vivek Sharma looked at me. Vivek was very judgmental at that point of time. Because, you know, he believed in young people a lot. But I thought that he always uh, would try to, what we'll call, do some ragada, understand the intent, understand the purpose. Skills come later, heart comes first. So uh, I would begin this conversation with one of the finest human beings I have known in the sector, who started a movement of Gandhi Fellowship, Vivek Sharma. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. And um, I would love to know more about the philosophy of Gandhi Fellowship and uh, specifically in light of COVID, how can we make the social sector a primary destination for the young people in the country? Thanks, Satyam. I think you've been very gracious uh, in saying what you did. Uh, see, these are bad times. And bad times are good times, great opportunities, great possibilities. But let's not delude ourselves. These are genuinely bad times, the kind that we've never experienced before. Uh, I think jobs are a crunch. I want to kind of put it out there up front. Uh, but when I look at it, when I look at uh, the historical, you know, the bubble burst in 2000 and 2008, uh, the crisis, the financial crisis, really, I, I, I'm very optimistic that 10 years ago, we laugh about this event, this downturn, this such a downturn that seemed like it's not going to take us anywhere. I think 10 years ago, we will be able to actually much less. In a couple of years, we'll be able to reflect on what did this event do to me? And the point is, and I am addressing the individual. I am saying, what do you create in this event for yourself? for you to be able to reflect on, I created something useful during this moment. You may not land a job, that's a fact. And uh, I'm being very, very upfront on that. The world's number one B school is advertising. Give me an internship if you can't give me a job. I mean, to that effect. Mm -hmm. So that's a fact of life. My point is, in this moment, I'm very happy to believe, uh, you know, IMF, which is saying that 2020, 21 is going to be what it is, but 21, 22 is going to be, India is going to grow at 6.57. So my point is, how do you prepare yourself for that growth that is going to happen next year? So how do you fill yourself up during this year? So how do you build a gap year, so to say? How do you curate your own personal gap year for you to create the narrative because when the economy rises and economy has to rise and I'm not just saying market economy, I'm saying social economy. See, the fundamental issue is that the training for participating in the social sector in India is very, very negligible as 
a percentage of the higher education you know total set now the issue is how do you therefore so there are two three actors here uh there is of course people like us who run the gandhi fellowship there's ravi and dr pralladan and you know uh, manushi from pratham and so many others who are trying to put their collective heads to how to solve for this but i think the fundamental solutions will lie in the crisis that has been created the fact that we do not have an effective pds system i think the government is headed towards a more aadhar jam based pds system now what does that require it requires some technology and a driven human resource the problem with our college university system is that they are not creating young people who understand who have a sense of who i am what i want to do what is it that i'll i think uh, vivek probably uh, facing uh, a whole range of uh, pedagogies that we practiced but right. really i think in the two years of the gandhi fellowship at the end of the four semesters these young people had reflected on how they wanted to spend their next 10 years and they had a dream of sorts and actually you know we turned some of the terminologies on their head we said millionaires in the 21st century are not going to be people who earn a million bucks millionaires in the 21st century are going to be people who touch a million lives how do you now you can touch a million lives you can make that impact any which way whether it is uh, samaj which is social sector whether it is bazaar which is the markets and the corporate world or whether it is sarkar see today sarkar has to also understand that they need to recruit for delivering services products of social good Agreed. markets are already under pressure there is a whole round a whole range of research that is available that you know working for shareholders values uh, is not the primary reason for markets to exist no. uh, markets which companies which keep the customer at the center so i'm mm-hmm. saying citizen customer and community it's the same set of population it's the same right. set of people right. so i think the paradigm that needs to shift is how do we create service uh translated in hindi that is seva right. you know you won't believe it that the 21st century skills donut that singapore has created mm-hmm. and the center of it is service mm-hmm. how do you build a service orientation right how do you focus on impact how do you build the empathy now for empathy you have to train to have a have a listening ability my college system unfortunately does not give train you for listening abilities because listening causes for empathy causes for actions for will and action and then continued you know continuous action now its processes like the fellowship mm-hmm. like the gandhi fellowship program which created these we curated these young people in small groups sitting in you know springboarding from block towns and four semesters they only focused on action because action gave them learnings on successes mm-hmm. and actions gave them learnings on failure right problem is my child my college university goer in the indian system has hardly experienced any failures right. as in curated failures so when you curate failures when you debrief as a group you figure out why i why you succeeded and i did not succeed Now, right. that debriefing is very important college right. university system is all about self whereas right. here it's all about teams anything big anything significant anything on scale that you want to do is teamwork right how do you then therefore curate this team and not just team of people like me but a right. diverse team of engineers of commerce walas of history philosophy walas and social work walas how do you curate together and engineers and how do you curate together and break the parts for achieving the sum of the whole right so the fellowship just four semesters creates this opportunity 
8 a.m. to 2 p.m., these fellows go to the schools. We tell them what to solve for in the schools because we have a sense of what what can be solved in a particular school right. because of the 10 years of use cases that we have. Right. And 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., they work in the communities. And in the community, they solve the problems they feel most connected with at the heart level. Right. So what is it that I want to transform? So that it becomes a sandbox, a learning lab for these young people. And that becomes the 14 hours a day of joyful doing. Every right. day they want to do what they want to do, what they are doing because there is learning, there is joy, there is creation, there is, you know, there is feedback and there is so much of learning that I can say 99% of my fellows tell me that the two years box more learnings than ever before in the life of that 22 year old. Right. Thank you, Vivek. I mean, I'm taking some key points of uh, for a lot of people who are looking for opportunities in the social sector, one being what do you create for yourself? I think you've also touched upon a lot of like soft skills which are important here. So we are looking, talking about empathy, we are talking about teamwork, and we're also putting Seva right at the center. And um, that leads to my next like, you know, speaker, uh, the person who actually decided to let go of his stellar corporate avatar. And I would say has started a college which is designed for Seva which is in the DNA of Indian School of Development Management. So here I have Ravi Shidharan from ISDM. Thank you, Ravi, for being with us. And my question is an extension of where, uh, where uh, Vivek talked about Seva and a lot of other skills and, and practical experience. So Ravi, what do you think are the skills that are required in the post-COVID era? So let's just say COVID has happened. Now, what do we need to uh, imbibe in terms of skill to prepare the young workforce? And we're talking about the next 10 years, right? What is your what is your take, Vivek, on this? Ravi. Sorry, what is your take, uh, Ravi? Yeah. On, yeah. No, no, thanks, Satya. I mean, you know, uh, recently somebody was telling me about how the world will be known as, you know, before Corona and after Corona. So it's, you know, interesting that the question is phrased that way. And uh, if I were to sort of break it up, uh, you know, I'd break it up into uh, skills that were always required in this sector, even before Corona but probably was, you know, a uh, missing element. And skills that are now required, you know, in because of Black Swan event has happened that you're probably going to see a new normal. And obviously one wishes that, you know, uh, the new normal is better and all that. But that we will see uh, in a couple of years, uh, like Vivek was saying. Uh, and I must also warn you and the audience that I want to give a very uh, narrow perspective from where I come from, which is this whole leadership and management space. And thereby I want to sort of build, uh, I mean, make it useful. Otherwise, there's just way too many things that one can talk about on the on the talent space. So on the first aspect of what is always needed, which is really where, you know, in many ways ISDM exists, is this critical gap in the sector, uh, we've always believed has been leadership and management talent. And, uh, you know, and if you think about it, the, the state uh, used the Samaj Sarkar Bazaar analogy that uh, Vivek used. The state has always had, you know, masters in public administration. Mm -hmm. The markets have always had masters in business administration. It's only the social sector that we've never believed in building organizations. And it was, and it has remained thereby, you know, other than few organizations in the country, uh, we have not been able to really sort of build organizations, have impact at population scale and things like that. Uh, and that for me is you know, even pre-COVID as far as I am concerned. And uh, in, in many ways, COVID has clearly demonstrated, you know, this critical need for leadership and management for impact at scale. I mean, how do you design interventions in a totally new thing that's thrust on your face? How do you bring system thinking and figure out all the linkages that need to be thought through? How do you then take it generations to, you know, population scale so that you know, we're struggling, you know, I mean, um, whether it is migrants, whether it is the number of people falling ill, whether it is the supply chains, on all fronts, we're struggling on how do you sort of intervene at scale. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes people confuse these leadership and management skills as what you bring from MBA schools. Let me warn the audience, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Yes, it is about people. Yes, it is about money. Yes, it is about culture. Yes, it is about organization. But more importantly, it's a lot to do with your understanding of society, your understanding of complex aspirations diverse people have, 
it's an understanding of what is universal human values how do you make choices based on some of those aspects uh, which become very critical how do you bring the agency of the people to bear how do you move from a business where your holy grail is to create that secret sauce to now actually creating a sauce that can be open and actually created by everyone so it's a very different uh, leadership that one is talking about so it is you know the management levers are the same it's people it's organization it's funny it's money it's cash flows and so on and so forth that's the first set the second set is really you know with the new normal you know what is it that we're going to see and thereby what are the skills that one would um, hope to see and uh, believe will be important uh, for me one of the big ones and i've always uh, had this uh, grouse against our sector is collaboration you know always in every instance talk about why collaboration is critical but you look around and see collaboration it ends up being conference room talk and really nothing beyond that i think that has really been broken by covid and today there's so much collaboration happening it's amazing how you know uh, the sector has come together to sort of work i mean there's so many states where the sector is feeling more migrant workers on the roads than even the government is able to do and it's it's amazing what collaboration can do so that's a whole new you know the knowledge attitude and skill skills required for working with a collaborative mindset and you know our schooling system as you know from day one builds you for competition you know it's never about collaboration so we have to change the whole mindset so that's a very big piece in my mind that we should see going forward the other is this idea which again i referred to earlier is about operating projects programs and organizations at population scale we really need to be obsessed with scale one of the things about the social sector is we've been very passionate about what we do the people we work with but scale somewhere is always you know seen as they are not in the numbers game and i don't think it's about numbers game you can't go to keep thinking that 95% of the population is still you know not getting the basic dignity the basic life so that obsession for scale i think needs to come in the third and i think uh, you know somewhere after independence the social sector lost its seat on the table before that the world was dominated at least in this country by the social sector i mean social sector really is what got independence and since then the state and markets have become very powerful and sort of you fell off the table and i think today you you're back there you know people are recognizing man this is the sector that's really there for you know the people for you know the or even for the government to carry out what it wants for the markets to carry out what it wants it can't do it without this sector so that i so you're suddenly going to be very well accepted all over again and i think we we in turn need to develop an ability to work with the state and markets so right. the understanding of how does the state work what are their challenges what are their limitations and the same thing with the market is very important for us to know that it's only then that we can work in those situations and the and the and the last is this idea uh, which has been talked around in many parts of the world but really not come in is is systems think that ability to think whole system you know because in a pandemic still you realize everything is jolted except that pandemic is huge you know even if you're working in school education you must recognize that it is a whole system that works around it when i started my life in school education i thought it was about teachers books classrooms you know uh, school management committees quickly i realized it's also about domestic abuse it's also about nutrition it's also about ecology and you realize that you have to be a systems thinker and that ability to think systems bring design thinking into you know designing interventions in these sudden situations is all very very critical and you know and i really think that for all this to happen and this is really for people in the sector uh we need to redefine talent management for the sector i mean i'm not even sure we had talent management in the sector we've just borrowed a few you know sort of ideas from the corporate and um, you know salary in- increments bonus jo bhi hai but that's all totally misplaced in the sector right. and i right. think it is super critical for the sector to realize that the reason talent joins the sector is not at all the reason they join the business the reason they stay is not at all the reason they stay in a business and the reason they get motivated is not at all to do with what they are motivated so we have to rewrite talent management so hr jo kehte hain hum you know which is all practice in the business really needs to be kept aside and rebuilt for this sector and right. talent management has to look at how do you attract people to the sector you right. know or for for heavens i can't understand why we can't pay well in this sector Right. this idea ki nahi nahi pay nahi karna chahiye at one point isdm actually put you know average salaries of our students 
and hell broke loose are why are you talking salaries we should ignore salaries i think that's nonsense i really think if you want to get great talent we should pay for good people right. so these are some critical things we should understand so the whole talent management space if you ask me has to be completely redefined and one last thing i'd say and this might be a little controversial and maybe vivek you're going to back me up for this but i am increasingly beginning to think that so far the the sector all of us hired people with passion mm-hmm. i am more and more con- that we must hire people for passion but also competence and i think increasingly if you grow your organizations you start becoming bigger then even more specialized competencies will start taking how do you manage people in the social sector you might need specialists for that how do you manage finances and financial risk in the sector you need specialists for that right. so i think we should start moving from uh, an earlier world where we hired largely now i mean obviously none of it is like uh, hard truth uh, from you know passionate talent to passionate plus competent talent so i'll, I'll stop there i think you know the ways i can go on on this so part. some very very valid things uh, ravi i mean thank you so much i mean talking about collaboration and all of us who have spent their careers in social sector know that there was no collaboration happening by and large at scale and covid has actually given us a tremendous opportunity to let go of our uh, deep mission statements program designs and all those things which we'll use and see that if we have to uh, you know एजुकेशन तभी होगी जब लोगों के पास खाने के लिए खाना होगा राइट right? uh, बाकी सारी चीजें मतलब सोसाइटी में नहीं एग्जिस्ट कर सकती जब तक बेसिक मींस ना हो तो आई थिंक वन थिंग माय बिगेस्ट लर्निंग अगेन हैज बीन दैट यू नो व्हेन वी से दैट वी कैन कंज्यूम एसेंशियल गुड्स सो आई थिंक इवन द जॉब्स इन द सोशल सेक्टर वुड बी एसेंशियल जॉब्स इन द फ्यूचर सो वी विल नॉट हैव जॉब्स विच आर नॉन एसेंशियल एंड दैट्स टू योर पॉइंट ऑफ कॉम्पिटेंसी हमारे पास काफी पैशन है ड्राइव है पर्पस है बट वी हैव टू मैरी इट विद लाइक यू नो सोल्यूशन विच कैन ऑल्सो वर्क फॉर बिलियंस एंड बिलियंस ऑफ पीपल इन दिस कंट्री सो आई वुड ऑल्सो लाइक टू यू नो समन रवि यू टच अपॉन दिस एंड वन ऑफ आर अटेंडीज आर आस्किंग अ क्वेश्चन अजरा हाउ कैन वी मेक द सोशल सेक्टर अपील टू यंगस्टर्स हु आर मनी ड्रिवेन ब्रैकेट नॉट ऑल बट मोस्ट ऑफ दैम वेन द सोशल सेक्टर विल बी सींग अ फंडिंग क्रच so i thought that you can take up this question and answer uh, how do we attract people and young people especially who are money driven since you talked about salaries in light of funding crunch is that question to me um, yes okay. to you yeah ha ah, no no you know i i find this really amazing right if you think about it one area that the markets have failed is to create exciting work and mind mm mm-hmm. and so has the state you know the social sector is the most exciting place to work you know right. the kind of problems that you're engaging with the kind of complexity that you're dealing with the kind of problems that you're trying to solve is just amazing and generally the culture in the social sector is far less hierarchical is far more collaborative is far more distributive is far more willing to learn by failures as we just heard vivek talk about I can't think of a more exciting space for a youngster to work Mm-hmm. the only reason that they don't work or they don't get attracted to the sector in my mind is we have sold the story you know the right. sector has been known as chola wala who does some charity work and the picture of our work is feeding a child or you know taking bandaging a person or some disability there's a lot more complexity to our work i'm not saying that even that work is any less complex i'm saying you know there's so much of work that is involved and i think the millennial generation i am most human beings you know get excited with solving tough challenges you know what is the i mean i went to an iit and i am what does the iit get excited about he gets excited about solving complex problems that's right. what excites great minds great youngsters you know so i think money uh, so while there is no money there's tremendous joy and satisfaction in what you build and all of us who are coming to the other end of our careers will tell you that is far more important than money money of course is required and that's the point i made and i think you have to find different ways of paying money and money doesn't have to only be that you know it's a salary for example i think the government should you know waive income tax on all people working in the social sector you know those are different ways of you know making the sector more interesting for youngsters to come and work the job itself is the most amazing job you can do you will not get it in the market space you will not get it in the state the social right. sector is easily the most but we have to sell that story we have to stop being this monolithic you know everything in the social sector is just this no there's so many aspects of social sector there's so many types of problems you can solve it at the grassroots level you can solve it at the intermediary level 
you can solve it at a systemic level you can solve it at a think tank level there's so many ways you can work so i mean my my word to any youngster and i actually i don't need to do it i think they tell me that you know they all tell me we want far more meaningful life we want far more meaningful careers i don't want to be sitting in an organization coding for the rest of my life or i don't want to be sitting with you know maybe a politician who's very corrupt or whatever it is i think the social sector is easily the most fascinating space i think we need to build media we need to build stories we need to be spokesperson for the space and make it exciting for the youngsters and then there is the leadership challenge as a leadership we need to know what is it that will excite a millennial what is it that will make them enjoy their jobs they don't like hierarchy though they don't like being you know over monitored and over told and i think there needs to be space for a lot more freedom a lot more failures a lot more getting out there so yeah I, that would be my message to uh, and really thanks to whoever asked that question great azra great thank you so much abhi this has been very very helpful and i will i will go back to again to 2008 so while i was looking for career opportunities and uh, having pizza with a friend of mine in slice of italy in delhi he said why don't you explore this professionally run ngo called pratham and i was like what is this professionally run ngo me they said like they are very professionally run and they do good work and you should definitely go and meet them so my my next uh, speaker manushi from uh, pratham being uh, and pratham is again a story which i don't think we need to tell the world i mean you know when we talk about stories and of success these are the successes which uh, one can achieve in the social sector and especially from a talent lens i would like to add pratham being one of the largest uh, recruiter or a workforce uh, organization in the country with more than 5000 people working for an ngo so i think we also understand that what kind of um, you know, volumes we are looking at when it comes to workforce but here my my uh, i would be personally more keen because i recently got introduced to uh, manushi by one of my ex bosses lukmani banerji and she said you must speak to this young girl and she is doing some incredible work and i think uh, all of us who have worked at pratham understands what when lukmani says something you have to listen to her you don't have a choice so i would love to understand manushi your uh, personal journey first of all of how you ended up at pratham and second uh, your opinion on inclusion in the site. so sure. um thank you actually uh, i don't think rukmini said that i don't trust that but i'll check <laughs> uh but um so she said that just <laughs> that's i'll still check <laughs> so um i'll just very briefly give a background i started in pratham about 5 years ago i have a business degree actually in undergrad from delhi university i worked in a corporate sector for a year but i happened to have exposure to social entrepreneurship while i was in college uh, i had managed a couple of social uh, enterprises and i realized a year into corporate sector i think as ravi was talking about uh, his experience from isdm and his experience in this sector i was reflecting on my own journey and suddenly you know half an hour into this conversation i was feeling very happy about my choices so uh, i left that sector mostly because i realized that yes want to live a more meaningful life it isn't just about money and i completely agree that those decisions are much more easier to take when you're younger i think for me to take a call of leaving coca cola and coming to pratham and letting go of whatever i was being paid at that point of time was easy to do when i was 21 and would of course be much difficult uh, right now but if i talk from the millennial perspective and that's the word ravi used it's that uh, i think when it comes to work of course there is a need to be able to be self sustainable and such from the money perspective but wanting to see some tangible change some impact that your work is creating to not just work on spreadsheets for life and just send it forward to your boss who works with his boss i think that's one of the reasons at least if i talk about my generation we started moving to this sector and i still feel uh, and now i will talk from pratham's perspective as a, as you mentioned a uh, uh, you know a big workforce that is employed by them as someone who recruits for pratham right now i think that is still the reason i feel a lot of folks start to come in that is how i would like to pitch pratham's work to be able to provide an opportunity to engage meaningfully even in a time like this uh, to not be sitting home redundant and when i'm talking about redundant i'm not saying without a pay i'm talking redundant in terms of that you cannot con contribute to what is happening across the country even at this point of time we may be working from home but we know that we are able to contribute towards making some bit of a difference so whether it's doing some remote learning activities whether it's just ensuring how you're going to be funded as an organization how these 7000 people that you're employed uh, you're going to be able to retain them 
over the course of the year. So whatever money, whatever work that you're going to be working on, it is actually meaningful in some way or the other. And then to talk about what kind of uh, you know folks we need in the sector, I think uh, both Ravi and uh, Vivek had touched upon this point. Uh, increasingly, yes, we are moving towards needing specialized workforce. Uh, you mentioned that Pratham is a professionally run organization, so we happen to have uh, what we call that you know the usual support functions of HR, of finance, of technology, and such verticals. But at the same point of time, I think what you need in the development sector. Is someone who's a generalist, someone who is capable of being a multitasker. Everyone has to wear many hats. Everyone needs to know how to work with people because this can never be a one-man show. And I think Vivek touched upon that as well. That this cannot be about your individual success. If if scale and impact is ever going to be something that is on your mind, it needs to come from someone who is capable of working with teams, who is capable of working with people across different, uh, you know, socio-economic and educational backgrounds. You will have folks working uh, at the field level who are engaging with children on the day to day and are actually the the meat of your organization and then you will have youngsters lateral hires working in a more specialized role but everything that they are talking about is actually coming uh, you know on the back of the work that the field team is doing so to be able to navigate the change from a professional setup to the personal to the you know more uh, socialistic background of what's happening on the ground to be able to navigate these sort of things to be able to navigate how to work with your beneficiary versus how to talk to your funder all of these skills to be as fluid as possible as dynamic as possible i think that is what is needed uh, for success in this sector and if this is the story you can pitch to a millennial if this is the story that is pitched to me that you get to wear these many hats this is what you get to do guaranteed you will have to take a bit of a pay cut but this is what you get to experience i think you can sell that story and i think that's something that pratham's been good at doing got yeah. it so yeah no that's that's very very i mean valid point i always think about it as uh, i mean something you said as a generalist and i call it tolerance towards ambiguity because <laughs> if that skill doesn't exist in this sector i think the covid happens pretty often in this sector because you know funders will come and ask you questions which you will not have answer to the priorities are changing i mean uh, a lot of covid happened in my life when funding from education went towards climate change in yeah. uh, 2016 and 15 era and a lot of large funders were moving their strategies and then you start understanding you know what what i think both uh, both ravi and both uh, vivek talked about that we are part of a larger system and economy we can't look at it in isolation we are samaj sarkar and bazaar and we are at a intersection as civil society and we have a very prominent role to play and i think a lot of time when we think of uh, when a lot of people say why social sector is not treated as a mainstream sector i think we are more than a mainstream sector because we are society we don't have to even i mean you can't say society has to be treated as a sector right i mean this is when you get out of the house this is how the uh, governance work this is how the transportation works i mean the problems we need uh, we are dappling within in sector uh, cannot be just uh, not to undermine that the corporations are not doing great work they are equally critical but some of the uh, problems cannot be resolved in isolation i mean you know we have seen how cities uh specifically around air pollution how it got reduced and how much we talked about farmers burning farmers burning sitting in delhi punjab mein ho raha hai punjab mein ho raha hai ab kya ho raha hai i mean you know you put people inside and air quality is outstanding in a city like that sorry i'm debating a bit but like i think manushi log like your uh, your generalist point resonated a lot with me and i think it is the need of the hour we need people who come with an open heart and open mind uh willing to uh you know pick up a problem and stick with that problem because some of these problems i think ravi touched upon i mean we have not addressed these problems since independence how do we aiming and aspiring to address this overnight right 10 saal lage the hame sarv shiksha abhiyan mein enrollment badhane mein 90 pratishat tak ab hum wapas enrollment kam ho gaya hai so all the work we did probably for you know 10 20 years we are going back in time and i think the hard work we need to put in in the sector is probably 10 times more than what yeah. all of us have done till date in the next 10 years um on that point uh, thank you so much manushi for like you know bringing that perspective and lens and also from a perspective of young people that you know how it was easy to make that choice when you were young 
Uh, so probably a request to all the young people that if you don't have liabilities, this is the best time to go and volunteer for every organization that is represented here uh, and you know create meaning in society. And on that note, I would like to bring in uh, uh, Dr. Pralathan from Bhumi, one of the largest volunteer-led NGO uh, with an active base of 30,000 plus volunteers. And I think that's where we need to learn from Dr. Pralathan that how can we engage with volunteers uh, at scale, especially in the present climate where when the government is not on the forefront, what we are seeing is the volunteers acting. And these volunteers are from all walks of life. They are not just from uh, social sector. Dr. At, uh, uh, at Bumi, the thought process is that uh, if you see a problem, Bumi is a platform for you to solve it. And you will always find uh, we're largely urban, not rural. So in a tier one, tier two city, you will always find like-minded people to solve the problem along with you. Uh, let's say there's a park near your house that you feel cleaning, or you feel that there are stray dogs on the road that need some help, you will always find like-minded people. And inherently, we feel that people want to help other people. Uh, they want to do it at their own terms. They want to uh, make a small uh, contribution to society while doing their regular jobs. And while ISDM or Gandhi Fellowship or even the Bhumi Fellowship is a, uh, an opportunity to take a deeper step into the social sector, you can first start by volunteering. If you look at uh, uh, you know uh, joining ISDM and taking a full-time career with Pratham as a you know deeper engagement with the sector, and if you don't uh, know where to start or you're apprehensive about uh, is this really for me, uh, volunteering is really the base of the pyramid of your uh, social contribution. Uh, you can try it out and. The way nonprofits work, including Bumi, there are lots of uh, opportunities for you. Let's say, even if you want to switch careers to some other sector, there are people who come here understood that, uh, who've done engineering and come here and understood that they're great with communications, they were great with filmmaking. Uh, no profit making organization would give you an uh, engineer a, a video editing job. But in a nonprofit, if you say you can do video editing, they'll say, come, we're waiting for you. So that's the kind of uh, 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 encouragement and excitement you'll, you'll get here in the sector. And you can try and fail. Uh, there's, you know, the bar is not so high. Uh, uh, but at the same time, the impact you can have is so huge, right? Um, we have 18, 20 roles leading 100 plus volunteers. Uh, the person has not even finished college. And, and many of them have then chosen after volunteering, you, you realize, okay, this is what I really enjoy. And I didn't enjoy doing engineering or whatever accountancy or whatever. I want to do a fellowship. There are people who've gone to TFI, Gandhi Fellowship. Uh, uh, someone went to ISDM. Uh, I know someone went to Pratham as well. So actually, we've had people from Bhumi going to all three other organizations in this panel. And uh, I feel that's where uh, volunteering stands. So uh, if you're free right now, see where you can volunteer. Of course, it's not safe to go outside and do things, but there are tons of things you can do online. Uh, you can uh, uh, call someone and mentor. There are so many opportunities that are coming up. But I think even in the next few months, as the world uh, is a different place, you'll probably spend lesser time traveling to work and working from home. What can you do in that one hour every day? Can you... Uh, teach a child uh, in a slum community, help the child with English or math or something like that. Volunteer with the local nonprofit, see what, so you're, a, you're an accountant, can you work with their accountant trying to help them get their accounts together? Um, while normal people and companies get three months to file their accounts, nonprofits are given six months to file their accounts, maybe because we struggle so much to do it. You know, you could add value to that. So there are lots of, in every uh, in every role you do, every skill you have, the nonprofits can absorb volunteers. Of course, nonprofits have slightly. Uh, everyone doesn't have the capacity to engage volunteers so much, but if you're not able to uh, work with a nonprofit organization, work with your citizen group. Can you clean? Can you and your flatmates clean the park nearby? Can so right now what we're doing during COVID is you can refer daily wages around you. 
you can fundraise for them you can help verify someone else will help verify whether they are, they need the funds and then the funds are transferred to them so see how you can support your local community self organize and do things uh, there are uh, people who've uh, rejuvenated uh, 15 20 acre lakes just by bringing the community together without any government help i'm sure you can clean up a small park near you very very valid points thank you so much dr prarath and i think uh, especially like the fact that you can volunteer wherever you are i mean all of us who are actually uh, uh, you know attending this zoom session watching youtube clearly we have an opportunity to help someone pick up the phone help someone and i think a lot of activities are going on in the sector whether it's around mentorship whether it's around like you know very very tangible skills of making presentations helping out a not for profit in running a campaign and i think that's where like critically i mean i always think that if there are millions of not for profit and all those millions of not for profit can get millions of volunteers uh what it would be like to you know problem solve that scale and uh, though bhumi has played a very very critical role on mobilizing 30000 plus volunteers for various different ngos and i think uh, one thing dr pralathan mentioned to me yesterday was that how bhumi will be happy to partner with more ngos to you know help them in their like volunteer needs and which is a, i think a critical need for the sector right now as we might not be able to afford what vivek said right at the beginning full time employees but i think uh, it's not only social sector which might not be able to afford full time employees i think the entire uh, universe is not uh, going to you know hire full time employees but at the same time i mean as arthan we recently conducted a survey with uh, some 194 organizations and 32% of them said that they are very happy to uh, you know hire a consultant so i think we are moving towards some version of gig economy in the sector if i use that term um but um, i do have question marks on that um uh, so yeah thank you so much dr pralathan i'm for very very like you know uh, and i like the points around self organize and do things and do it locally so we don't have to always problem solve for very complex problem sometimes we can problem solve for clean the road outside your house and that's okay. a good enough work too so i mean you know there is dignity in every work we do and we need to work with people we we live right next to right so that's a that's a great great uh, feedback thank you dr pralathan i'm going to take uh, we have got very very interesting questions so i'm going to take certain questions where people have specifically mentioned the name of the speakers um, and i'll begin with vivek because vivek went first so vivek this is a question for you which is um, mindset of designing interventions while thinking of scalability while a lot of organization interventions rely on different ideas of development to what extent you see the beneficiaries excluded from this process because of a top down approach claiming to work on needs could i repeat that question vivek yeah i think yeah so mindset of designing interventions while thinking of scalability while a lot of organizational interventions rely on different ideas of development to what extent you see the beneficiaries excluded from the process because of the top down approach i think here the emphasis on excluded not included see i'll tell you uh, my own gandhi fellowship experience mm -hmm. and the beauty of the gandhi fellowship was that we built an organization where the the person who serves the community is the smartest person in the organization so gandhi fellow is a cherry picked you know 100 200 people from all the college colleges of the country so we picked up the smartest people who work at the grassroots and that is the reason that we are a 12 year old organization in in such a short span of time we created scale primarily because this smartest person at the grassroots was engaging with the community every day and doing nothing else because we believe exactly what you're saying what the question uh, the question is posing that a lot of these solutions need to come from the community and that's why i said that really smart people i didn't say english speaking people we cherry pick the smartest people to work as our karyakarta our grassroots worker uh, in the name of the fellowship 
so these fellows they worked they went to the community every day listen to them spent time with them lived with them for two years it wasn't a you know parachuting into the communities you know pick up their general knowledge and uh, then go back to the design studio but they actually cohabited with the communities and they looked at the problems in very objective ways see the entire generalizations that we pick up at, in college i mean the entire myths uh, kind of crashed in the head of this young delhi university you know fellow because they had sitting in canteens and sitting in the reading the uh, feminist literature in uh, in my classic example is that you know going to lsr you you know you grew up a feminist and you your your entire you know body of uh, engagement was the violence against women but when you lived in the village for 2 years you found it is not just violence against the women it's violence against the poorest it's the dalit there is violence period now how do you therefore solve how do you therefore open your mind's eye beyond the theoretical readings that you made in college and how do you then solve for it and then you began to see hindu aise hote hain muslim aise hote hain boodhe aise hote hain jawan aisa sochte hain you know all of these constructs i i can promise you you know a lot of young people come and say you know we should stop migration but really you know 15 years of having gone to the grassroots i realize that everyone wants to migrate to cities and while we may have this uh, utopia in our heads ke gaon sundar hai but really the poorest of the poor who's migrating to the city actually experiences living in the slum experiences a lightness of being because the social power structure the weight under which that individual is stuck in the rural space in the caste system in the economic uh, you know uh, structure once that this person moves to the urban space feel experiences a castlessness a certain a, a certain you know escape from uh, her misery now that experience is one of the key reasons besides the fact that you know you can theoretically talk about minimum wages but minimum wages will be less than the mandates or what the rights walas will tell you primarily because the products that you create at the end of the day they have only finite value now if you are creating a product worth 100 bucks you cannot get a minimum wage of 300 bucks so these paradoxes so the design fundamentally and i i have i i have i kind of stay i mean we've experienced it for the last 12 years that we did not build the organization it's the theory of change came from the bottom from the connect from the community and actual design and implementation happening in the same place and because these are young people they are not attached to their solutions so they are very nimble quickly you know rejig the solutions when they fail we debrief it why it didn't work was it the complexity in my head or was it the complexity that i was delivering you know my classic my classic example is a dalit student he said mere gaon mein barbers were not cutting the hair of dalits he said it took me less than 4 weeks of internship with a barber and i learned to cut hair i opened a barber shop in my village after work after college i mean you know it's it's a game changer right. so look at the innovation look at the look at the you know look at the design thinking there look at the heart of this person and look at the look at the you know the the ability of this person to challenge the entire structure i mean this is a this is a gandhi in making i mean right. if this if this kid got fellowships if this kid created a method for herself I mean, what was Gandhi? Gandhi that 23 was thrown out of a train. He could have as well beaten up the, you know, TT, which is what I would have done as a 23 year old. You know, right. I would have just, you know, hit my hard fists at the TT and, you know, felt very happy that I beat the shit out of this guy. Right. But I mean, uh, how does he create this, you know, whole movement in his 
first decade, I mean, from 23 to 33. So the fellowships are simulating these ideas where thought works are rising from the bottom and reaching the top. And we as smart people, as the leadership team, are consolidating them into IP, which is scalable, replicable, which is what then goes to the government. And the government says, wow, this is a great idea. But this right. idea was seeded in a village in Junjunu. Right. So I think there is a paradigm shift that is happening. And particularly organizations which value young people uh, are being more successful at creating, you know, what I may call, uh, you know, grassroots sandboxes, uh, eventually, you know, becoming, uh, you know, design labs and, uh, you know, thought works and game changes. Right, right. Va valid points, Vivek. And I think, I mean, this definitely has answered the question. I guess in social sector, you cannot design interventions without keeping the community in mind. So like Vivek started out with saying Seva, I think it's Seva and community married with each other right at the heart. Solutions are for them. Your solution is not for anyone else. I mean, yes, funders are critical and you have to write those grant proposals and make it very, very fascinating and scalable. But at the end of the day, if that beneficiary is not valuing the work you are doing for them, uh, you would not grow. I mean, that's, that's a basic mantra of like the social sector. Thank you, Vivek, for shedding a light on that. Um, and talking about like, you know, Gandhi in light of the Gandhi fellowship too. My next question is, uh, I think uh, Ravi, this is a question you should answer, which is I'm reading it out. So hi, I'm an engineer from Bits Pilani. I've worked at Pradhan and JPAL over three years. I'm going to the Harvard Kennedy School MPID on a scholarship. I have few concerns about continuing in the sector after MPID. Point number one, People with private sector experience are preferred over career not-for-profit folks for leadership roles. Ravi, I think you'd be the best person to answer this. Yeah, no, beautiful question. And, and you know, if I'm a little trivial, why are you going to Kennedy to study? You could have come to ISD. And it's my yeah. first point because you should study in India when you want to work in India. That's That's... I mean, jokes apart, but that is a problem. You know, there is a feeling that sirf Howard ko aata hai, or Wharton ko aata hai, or Columbia ko aata hai, or humko kuch nahi aata hai. And that's also, and I'm not blaming the individual. I think as a system, we have not institutionalized learning. We have to create institutions that make it very aspirational for youngsters. Anyway, that's an, as, an, uh, as an aside. This question about valuing, uh, you know, the, a certain type of people versus the homegrown sort of a people, I think that is a very sad reality. Partly I can understand, but largely I cannot understand. Uh, and I think what happens is that uh, there is a tendency to value softer skills uh, involved with people management as you go into senior levels. And somewhere that is like a core competency in a lot of the business type areas. And thereby that is perceived. So you understand balance scorecard, you understand reward structures, you understand performance management, you, un you, know, you know to hire, you know to fire. And that tends to be assumed as an important characteristic here. Whereas that phenomenal thing that, you know, like Vivek said that you build from the grassroots, you know what the person you're working in society actually needs, things feel, you know how to engage that person and bring those skills in, that gets sort of forgotten. And the reason is that uh, and, and again, I, you know, it might sound like I'm pitching ISDM is because we have never treated the space of management for the development sector as a specialization. We have assumed that management from the business can be applied here, which is why the so-called senior managers or middle managers who come from the corporate world are straight away taken into these roles. And believe me, the, the failure rate of the corporate guys who come across is two out of three. So out of every three people who have come crossed over, two people have failed. Because, you know, like Manushi said, you need, I mean, I wouldn't say you need generalists. I need, I'd say you need multiple specializations rather than as a generalization. You need to be able to do accountancy. You have to do people management and you have to do fundraising. So, in world, mein wo hota nahi hai because I have a specialization for everything. I don't have budget. Wahan pe marketing budgets bahut hote hai. So, they actually fail when they come here. So, I think it's, there is this dominant bias that management skills are required as is from the business world to the sector, complete disaster. You do need management skills, 
but you need it to be rooted in this sector with all the things i told earlier which is understanding of values understanding of participative processes and so on and so forth and i think that needs to be broken so one of the things i hope to do with isdm is break that myth that you know management as is, as taught in an mba school is what you need to run this social sector no that doesn't work baba you need we need and all of us need to build the space of what is leadership and management for the social sector yes it still involves managing people managing money managing infra managing process managing project etc but it has a very different foundational basis on which you you know i have a simple example out of an mba school i was taught to compete everything was competitive i had to get market share i had to win customer i had to win eyeball whatever it was yahan pe competition doesn't work so if i come with that mindset and i start running things here i'll create a competitive culture in my organization i'll create a rat race within my organization i'll do all the wrong things and i will collapse which is why that failure rates are also very high but i just empathize with that question because there's a dominant bias and one of the reasons i've unfortunately seen stellar youngsters going off to get these quote unquote label degrees is because they think yaar nahi to mujhe koi chance nahi dega you know i will always be you know treated inferior to this guy who's come from canada or come from png or come from wherever you know no right. i think that's that's a sad reality we need to break that that's a challenge for the sector right. no very very valid points and i think you know something uh, this is a comment which started on a linkedin post i did yesterday someone said that people with foreign universities are valued a lot more and i replied back saying that people with foreign universities would be less than 0.05 in the sector but at the same time i do think um, it's worth doing that analysis because i don't think largely the sector has foreign degrees so i think there is a myth that needs to be busted because people see a lot of people working for let's say the foundations with a foreign degrees and they start treating that as a benchmark but that's not representative of the overall civil society in general um, and also i like the point you made ravi which is i mean yes there is an inherent bias to bring in people from corporate sector who would have worked that scale and you know uh, multiple countries geographies softer skills are very very strong uh, but at the same time uh, i think we have also seen a lot of people from the private sector who are not being able to deal with the ambiguity and the you know which which comes in in this sector on a day in and day day, day out basis so i think social sector i mean i mean social sector means go back to the drawing board wipe out the past have a clean slate and uh, start fresh as if you are 21 out of college and drop the notions of what you would have learned i think that's that's how i would like look at the social sector thank you so much ravi uh, uh, manushi uh, there is mr satendr kumar from center for social equity and inclusion he has asked an interesting question which is if we are working for the marginalized why don't we have people from from that background working in the social sector how can we ensure that there are equ like equity measures being taken across fellowship programs hr and innovation i think this is another inclusion question which has popped yeah. up and i thought you would be the right person to answer this yeah. i think i think that's a that's a completely valid question i think uh, i will talk from uh, my experience with prathama i think uh, that is definitely the case i think this Vic, vivek illustrated this point as well with regards to gandhi fellowship uh, from an implementation organization perspective i think you need to have folks from across different socio economic backgrounds you need to have local leadership which is actually informing what a project should all be about right so you can't take a top down approach and that's what our previous question was about you can't take a top down approach or a one size fits all and take it from up and then take the same thing to tamil nadu it's not going to work like that every single program every single village will have its nuances and unless and until you have folks who are working from the ground up uh, it won't work so i think one of the things to do here is that i think the challenge that we run into is that folks see talent in social sector only as the people who are talking externally to different organization or talking at these forums that is reflective of a very small percentage of the talent that exists within the sector mm -hmm. uh, if i talk about pratham we have we'll have around 100 150 people working out of our central offices who are the ones who are 
very clearly called support staff. I myself lead a program management function. This is a support team. The real work and implementation team resides in the state. They are the folks who are working on the ground. They are the ones who do the work, inform the work, inform the program. And then it is a function of people who may be slightly more articulate, may speak English better to write about this work, to be able to take that theory of change and be able to document it and then go outside and sell it for to funders. So I think that's what we need to take care, think of that uh, when you see us sitting over here talking at this panel, this is not the talent of the social sector. These are the voices for the social sector, for the folks, the end number of folks who are actually working on the ground. And that is inclusive. I, I cannot say that, of course, it's foolproof. Uh, definitely things can be improved. But yes, when it comes to implementation organizations, more and more there are organizations who are learning from the ground, then informing the interventions, and then taking it to the government for scale. And and as Vivek said, then the government's like, oh, this solution has come to us. But it's actually nothing but things how they should have been, which worked in one village level, which have been put into a fancy presentation by someone, a consultant-like person, and then told to the government. And if I uh, you know, bring this topic back, back to our topic of conversation, which is about talent in this sector, and I think the last two questions also uh, touched upon this point, I think it's extremely important to not think of yourself if you are choosing say social versus over corporate don't think of this as you uh, you know doing something like you are this uh, person who is entering the sector to do people to do bhala for people that is not what you are coming to do you are making this as a career choice right, right. you are coming in to first learn from the sector learn from the people who have been doing work here for so long with an open mind that maybe you do have talent that can be leveraged by the sector better but first you have to understand the sector Right. And you, if you use this one year where we are saying that there's going to be instability in the job market and such to first get a feel of what it would look like and then start adding value from next year and being gainfully employed in the sector, I think that's going to be a great use of time for someone at this point of time and also a way to bring in talent to the sector. Right. Yeah. No, very, very valid point, Manushi. I like the fact that, you know, you have to keep, don't treat it as if you are doing a self-sacrifice. No, yeah, this is not a charity case. Yeah, this is so not a charity. Yeah. The, the people, I mean, you are doing it because you want to do it. And I think Vivek is raising the hand there. So I'm <laughs> going to pass this on to Vivek. Vivek, please, like, add, yeah. So please, I mean, you know, I think this myth uh, is kind of, you know, it's, it's carried because, you know, panels have people like us. But mm -hmm. as Manushi said, but see, please understand the, the, uh, the, the, the social sector. What are the competencies which are important for the social sector. The competencies that are important in the social sector are your ability to work with the communities and listen to them, learn from them, solve with them, solve for them. Now, these are all grassroots uh, competencies. Now, who is successful in grassroots competencies? People who are in fact, in the Gandhi Fellowship, what is the most beautiful thing is we have three kinds of people coming into the fellowship. Urban schooling, urban college, rural schooling, urban college, and rural schooling, rural college. Mm -hmm. In the first semester of the fellowship program, the Delhi University guys don't know how to even deal with the, you know, Balrampur in UP or, you know, Garchiroli in Maharashtra. It is the local men and women, young men and women who actually help them negotiate. Right. So what happens is that at these rural, rural uh, walas, they learn from urban, urban walas. Mm -hmm. And the bridge is the rural, urban walas. So right. it's a mix of the three types. In social sector, Angreji speaking has only limited value. Right. Right. Uh, otherwise, Pratham you know, the large mass of Pratham population was the Bal Sakhis and Bal Sakhas who right. were from the communities, who ran a two-hour class. And from those Bal Sakhis and Bal Sakhas rose the leaders of the city level. The city managers were from select few from that cadre. So right. it's actually a mix of the two. Unlike, unlike the urban bias, where the rurals stay on the periphery and the margins. If I look at a Delhi University typical college, 
the hindi bhashis are in a corner and angreji bhashis are in a particular you know occupy a particular space in social actually that gets reversed in fact the dalit gets a voice in social sector because she knows the pain of the woman during her thousand days pre uh, delivery and post mm-hmm. it's the most silent poorest poorest of the poor boy who has just been invisible just been listening intently to you who comes up with the best insight so right. actually in social sector it's uh, you know the heads are turned and that's the beauty and that's the counter intuitiveness and that's the that's 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 the dynamic of this sector where right. everyone learns and what ravi said a while ago it becomes a kind of a space where there is teamwork and where there is collaboration and then creating the big idea right right no very good very valid points vivek i like the urban urban and rural urban and i like that divide example because i think we need to bridge that gap and clearly in this uh, time when we are talking about reverse migration when people are going back from the cities to the hinterland i think we are looking at you know 70% of this economy is still agrarian so i mean this is only going to grow on the agriculture side i mean there are people who are big advocates of like looking at farming and agriculture and they think it's a great opportunity for that sector when this reverse migration is happening and while the industry industrialization that has happened is going to suffer because you know people people who are distressed and left the cities because cities have not taken care of them they are not going to come back immediately i mean something for all of us to think about dr pralathan you have been uh, silent for a while and i think i've got a very exciting question for you which is while volunteering is great and according to cm cmie report approximately 60 million young people will be will lose their jobs um how do we feel that volunteering sometimes become exploitative and not to like you know continue with that um so people do sometimes feel that uh, so when you uh, when a volunteer takes on some responsibilities we keep giving more responsibilities uh, and there are people who complain that uh, this should be a full time person job uh, i think the at the sector uh, we should look at what appeals to the volunteer what would motivate that volunteer what is the volunteer passionate about first step is to scope the opportunity first is i mean i think the bigger problem is that non profits don't understand that so much more can be done by volunteers that is the bigger problem but uh, in the in the non profits who understand that these are roles that can be done by volunteers sometimes you tend to if somebody is there willing to do some things you you give more and more because you think the person is willing but then the person starts feeling that this is a full time person's role uh, uh, i don't think uh, the intention is to exploit uh, non profits have uh, sometimes uh, you know someone was talking about being uh, ready with the ambiguity so uh, roles are not uh, sometimes defined hence uh, volunteers are expected to do things uh it's not with ill intention but it it does end up happening right right so great so i think it's a i mean what i'm hearing is that you need to define the role of the volunteer and i think in a very concrete manner and that that goes back to how ravi would say like you know the competencies matter and it has to be matched with what you need to need in the organization right so we clearly need like a, a balance of like you know Uh, understanding of the skills and the softer side and everything else on that front ravi i have a g- question coming in for you is it important to um, balance importance sorry it, it's important to maintain a balance of importance and respect for all kinds of talent coming to the social sector english speaking folks have their own space and own importance and non english speaking folks have their own roles and importance balance is super important what is your take on this you know i'm so happy that question has come up because i was about to put my hand up and say i want to make a comment so this is absolutely right i think one thing we must remember and this is one of the mistakes i feel as a sector we have made is we can't be little any sector you know i think there is space for the english wala there is space for the hindi wala there is the space for the telugu wala tamil wala malayalam wala there is a space for the you know Uh, elite college students and there is you know space for the you know rural college students and there is space for the harvard kennedy so i don't don't think we should ever be little anybody and i think that's a mistake we make so for example today a lot of bright minds 
you know, this is from the schools and, you know, the talented people sometimes have formed this opinion that this is only voluntary work and this is only in the villages of social work. Or kuch nahi hai. Whereas, you know, those are myths that we should not perpetuate. So I, I would like, uh, I mean, I'm, and I'm sure everybody on this panel would agree that there is a space for pretty much every background because like you said, Satyam, this is society. And I think society is comprised of all these people. So there is no question of one type is required and one type is not required. I think it is critical that we inspire people from all backgrounds to get excited. They might come in the volunteering route. They might come in the job route. They might come in in whichever format. But I think there is a space for everyone. And I think this idea also that uh, the social sector is one monolithic structure is not true. You know, it has many colors and shapes to it. You know, I saw one of the questions somewhere in between, which said that I have facilitation skills. What do I do at mid-career? I have a TFI guy. Now I, I, it's no longer, you know, a value there. I mean, there are intermediaries, there are consulting organizations, there are implementing organizations, there are funding organizations with the evolution of, you know, social sector, capital market, there is further roles coming up. So we need all types. We need the, you know, the bean counters. We need the number crunchers. And somebody else asked me, you know, I'm a social, I mean, uh, I'm a humanities student. I don't understand Excel and all that. Yeah, we need those people also, right? And I think it's very, very important. I'm really glad this question has come up that we do not paint one idea of what is required for the social sector. The social sector is a complex space. It needs different, different talent. And we must be able to demonstrate how, irrespective of your background, this social sector has a job for you. No, that's a great... Do you uh, agree with that? No, that's a great point. I mean, the so social sector, I mean, I think on the from an inclusion lens, probably we are the most inclusive. Because, um, and I think Vivek touched upon this, Manushi touched upon this, Dr. Pralathan mm. has talked about this mm. too. I mean, this is not a language play. Angrezi bolne ka matlab nahi aapko naukri mil jayegi. Angrezi bolne se ho sakta aapko interview mein kuch round clear ho jaye. But uh, phir Vivek Sharma type ke log baithe hai dood ka dood paani ka paani karne ke liye. And I think humare sector mein no one hires in one round of interview. I still remember this uh, logic of uh, Ragda. Then we will roll out full-time employment contract. So I think this sector has also learned its hard way of like who can speak and who can really walk the talk. And I'm still proud of the fact that people who are walking the talk and they have been consistent with that. It has not changed uh, no matter whether 2008 economic recession to COVID coming in right now and probably a lot more things that will come our way. This sector has resilience. This sector has shown that you can come together and act because I think this is the only sector where for partnerships, you don't send proposals saying, I'm going to do X, you are going to do Y and we are partners. So people say, hi, we are partnering with each other or someone WhatsApp me reply kar deta, yes, we are going to partner. Then the rest team figure out what they both have done and what they have done in the same way. What partnership mean and what they so yeah, I mean, I would like to, you know, and this is my question before. There are lots and lots of questions. Sorry, guys, I won't be able to answer. Uh, Vivek is raising his hand. But just, just a 10 second interjection. I yeah. read a lot of questions. These are all intellectual questions. Right. I right. suggest go to Dr. Prahladan's platform, volunteer, do stuff with your hands, 10 hours a week, you know, to 50 hours a week, depending on your preoccupations or lack of it. Do stuff and then arrive at some of these questions because a lot of these are generalizations which are uh, which don't apply all the time in every case, you know, in all uh, times of the year. Right. No, thank you so much, Vivek. I think that's a very, very valid point. And I would have said this too. I think a lot of time my learning has been while we are looking for jobs, while we are exploring opportunities, we think a lot about self too. And I think I will link it back to Vivek's point. I mean, selflessness begins in this sector. So, I mean, the moment you will let go of like, this is the tag I have, this is what I have done, this is where I fit in, these are the people I need to be, the probability of finding an opportunity increases drastically. I always say to people that you have done so much effort in that organization to understand the real core and meaning. It doesn't mean that you don't know about the vision statement, mission statement, or strategy, or the founder's background. Uska hai matlab hota hai ki kitte grassroot level workers se aapne baat ki hai about their real day-to-day -day kaam. So 
I think there are various ways of looking for opportunities in the sector and it's not top down. I think that I can tell as a talent mm. intermediary right now. And um, I would like to, I mean, you know, and I think that's my pet question uh, right now, that if someone is looking for jobs in the social sector in the next seven months, how they should go about it? And that is a job question for all of you. And if you have to define it in like one sentence, Vivek, you want to go, or Dr. Pralathan, you want to go first. Anyone can go first. Actually, there's no sequence here. Who wants to go first? You can raise your hand. No, I'm not going first. Dr. Pralathan wants to go first. Yes. I would say, uh, I would say thousands and thousands of people should consider this option and start by volunteering. If this is what you want to do, then consider one of the deeper options like doing a fellowship or joining ISDM or joining a non-profit organization and doing it. Great. But do start. So act now. No point to think about it. Don't spend too much time researching about opportunities. Dr. Pralathan is a big promoter of uh, self-organize and do it in your neighborhood. I think that's where it begins right now in the COVID era. Great. Thank you. Valid points, Dr. Pralathan. Ravi, what's your... Uh... Yeah. No, I think uh, uh, it really will be in the same same uh, sort of uh, space as what doctor uh, just talked about. Uh, and it's essentially, first of all, plan for a job hunt of six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. You never know when you're going to get it because it is going to be a long hunt. You might get it in one month, you may not. But definitely on a parallel track, invest in yourself. And like, you know, Vivek said and uh, Doc said, uh, volunteer, try out, it's not anything else, travel, go, you know, see places and people that you've not seen or come and study in places like ISDM, investing in yourself. And the second part is what do you invest in yourself? I think there's a new normal you're going to see post COVID. So if for example, public health is going to be a big space in the future, figure out how you build your competencies in public health. Because I think in the future world earlier, education got 40, 50% of the budgets in this country. I think in the world ahead, a lot of this reverse migration is going to focus more monies on livelihoods and you know, sort of lives and uh, the remote parts of the country, it's going to spend a lot more on public health. So invest in yourself, but think what might be a future and you make your punt and invest in those directions. And uh, yeah, good, good year to invest in yourself. So I mean, good year to learn, good year to identify what you're really passionate about. Good year to, I think, Ravi's experiment. point. Experiment, competencies. I mean, you know, understanding where your core strength lies. I think, and we need to go beyond, uh, I saw some of the question talking about Microsoft and, you know, uh, PowerPoint presentation, Excel, and this and that. I think these are the skills one can pick up. These are not things that, you know, that you need to go and attend a college or a university degree to pick up these tools. And we are seeing, you know, all of us are here in Zoom and acting as if we are sitting in a room with each other. I mean, we have picked it up in under eight weeks. Zoom is the new normal. It's a new vocab in everyone's life which was not there like, you know, like six months back. Hey, thank you so much, Vivek. Uh, sorry, thank you so much, Ravi. Uh, yes, Vivek, what's your uh, take? So COVID, no COVID, 21st mm -hmm. century was about learning. And mm -hmm. we, we are hearing there are not going to be jobs available for people, ML, AI, and you know, all that phenomena. Uh, but people who are going to be relevant are people who can relearn and who can unlearn. So creating, a, I'm saying 2021 is your year for souping up your CVs, jazzing up your experience, create, curate these 12 months, learn to cut people's, you know, the hair of Dalits, you know, trek up to Kalimanjaro nahi hoga is saal, but do those, you know, gap year things create the learnings that you never got the opportunity for, build your CV in this year. So in the subsequent years, when the markets are picking up, <coughs> when uh, social change becomes more organized, because right now there's so much of social change happening, but it's not organized right now. So when things organize, prepare yourself for that. Tell a great story of how I spent this year. If you have a great story of how I spent my downtime, I'm certain you are going to be relevant for, uh, you know, 12 months later. 
great points uh, vivek i mean that's a story of like what i did and i think that's exactly how you uh, started out with too that this is this is clearly a time of like you know um, what do you create for yourself and um, how do you narrate it to the world and that's where also it's it's powerful to keep it um, connected to what you really believe in and not just from a narration lens i'm i'm, I'm answering uh, a, a great friend of mine named gorav shah said satyam your ragda example is not a great example because people with english speaking skills also have a role to play clearly gorav uh, we have a role to play i think you and i are uh, talking on zoom that's that's exact uh, exactly because of the same reason ravi i've got a good, great uh, sorry let me just finish this off before i go to questions again once more uh, manushi what's your take on this <laughs> yeah i think echoing most of what what's been said but i would just say that you know uh, one is of course to learn more things the other is to think about what skills do you have right now and how can they be put to use at this point of time because if i talk from a not for like a social sector for example if you're an engineer there are so many organizations right now that are facing this challenge of becoming tech safe tech tech savvy in like a period of a month offer services reach out to them right on linkedin do these things but just try to be useful are for any organization the hiring processes must be in upheaval right now first they don't know if they're hiring second most of them put people through a field visit or something and travel is not possible so instead of just waiting for those things to become normal again offer to intern let them get to know you if money isn't a barrier for the next 2 3 months intern let them get to know you and then maybe as soon as they start hiring you'll offer, of course have a first mover's advantage than someone else would have and then lastly of course continue learning uh there are going to be a lot of changes in the market uh social sector itself uh how can any any single seva be done remotely i think that's going to be the big focus for the sector for years to come so if you're able to find good courses good opportunities to learn about those things please do that and uh, yeah just continue learning i think during this period great i mean that's a uh, that's a like a you know very very valid point and uh, and i think you know sometimes i always think uh, i mean i have a i have a really bad memory of high school because i thought that there's so much pressure of like high school matlab agar aapke 90% nahi aaye to aap stand hi nahi karte society mein and then when i think about it right now ki who remembers high school i mean you know and then it happened the same thing repeated uh, got repeated in class 12 19 hi aaye to matlab koi future hi nahi hai now you don't have any memory of that then some some version of that got repeated in college like you know if you're not at the top of the class and you're not going to get placed if you're not working for mckinsey then what is the future uh, so every time when you go back and think about these things that how how limited we were in our thinking by thinking of career choices that were the only options and a way out and if you really start questioning who is creating more value in society it's a big question to ask i mean even as a young person and i think that's where uh, you know i would go back to some of the questions and i think ravi this question is uh, um, sounds like uh, you should answer which is um, what are the issues that top stop organizations from investing in skill building on current employees personal growth becomes a solo project based on my experience <laughs> you know this is one of the sad realities and you know even study after study will show you that capacity building is the critical requirement and the money is available for capacity building is the most limited and also the nonsense of 5% overhead 10% overhead has always been this you know sort of uh, big block in the sector uh, i think we need to change that mindset you know and, and those are things you can learn from the corporate world investing in good talent is super critical for any organization to succeed and keeping money and time for that is super critical if you are not spending at least 10% of every individual's time for their own personal development i think you have completely lost it and the organization will become a dead organization in the very immediate future so i think it is very critical that organ and i think i i wouldn't blame the organization because they actually recognize that i would blame funders i think funders need to recognize that there should be funds earmarked for capacity building i mean i remember some famous corporate guy who said that you know the ceo asked the hr guy what if we train all these people and they leave us you know it'd be a waste of money and the guy replied saying what if you don't train them and they all stay back you know right. that's worse 
So I think it's super important that we invest in people and it will pay back in, in, in multiple terms. I think funders need to get that. Great, great. Thank you so much. Very valid point. I think, I mean, people are the backbone of the organization. So all these Maybe. things we talked about wouldn't exist if there are no people. Just like the fact there are people here in this panel talking about it. I mean, you know, we form institutions. Institutions don't form us. And that's where the individuals and your value systems and your skills are critical. I would, I would, I would like to close on some of the skills we talked about here, uh, where it, we started out with Seva, like Vivek specifically focusing and saying, keep it at the heart of everything. Uh, Ravi touched a lot upon collaboration and competencies. I think, and the softer skills, which are critical in the sector. And I think ISDM is doing an incredible job in doing that. And I think, uh, you know, Manushi talked about being a generalist, which is also connected to my philosophy of tolerance towards ambiguity. And I think there's so much ambiguity right now. That's the best time to get prepared for the social sector. And I think our, uh, Dr. Pralathan has talked about self-organizing, which is actually quite a skill. It's not easy because, you know, we talk about big, th big things on social media it's probably next to impossible to get out and get your neighbors to do something. And all of us know this thing in urban areas like house like, because we don't act as a community in our own neighborhoods. So that's a great, uh, great point, Dr. Pralathan. Thank you so much, everyone. I mean, it has been a tremendous learning for uh, me personally, listening to all of you. And um, I'm sorry that I've not been able to answer all the questions. I will speak to the Nudge team and see if we can get back to some of these people individually 101. Not all questions were generalist, so some of the questions were very, very specific. Uh, please feel free to reach out to all of us. Uh, you can take the details from the Nash team, and uh, you can also find us on social media. Thank you so much once again. Um, have a great evening. I'm sure that there are incredible sessions lined up, so please stay back and attend those sessions. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists, and especially Satyam for pulling together such an interesting conversation. It uh, um, it was as entertaining as it uh, as I thought it would be. Um, all of you came up with such incredible insights. I know that there, this is a session which had the most number of questions, and I'm hoping that uh, maybe a few of you can stay back and answer, reply back to these questions. You just have to go off video, and uh, we will start with the next session with Dr. Ramanan, who's already here. Thank Let's you. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.